you? Mm. Mark chapter 5, if you have that, would you stand please? Mark chapter 5, we'll begin reading in verse 21. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him. And he was nigh unto the sea, and behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet, and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him, and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather, say the next two words, grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind, and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. Last week we looked at the maniac of Gadara, that man possessed with the legion of demons, and how Jesus rescued him and then restored him. We preached on better than ever. But I want us to look this morning at this passage and look at somebody worse than ever. In verse number 26, she had, it's not getting better, she's getting worse. Sometimes we find ourselves worse than ever. Amen. You can be seated. Verse 21, Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side. If, if you remember in chapter 4, he told his disciples, hey, let's go to the other side. In chapter 5, they get to the other side and immediately there met him a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit. And, uh, and Jesus uh, uh, cast those devils out. They all went into the, feet, the, the flock of swine, ran down a steep place into the sea and were choked. And then the people of Gadara, the town where he was, they came out and they saw the man who had been possessed sitting clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid, it says in verse number 17. And they said, no, you got to go. And they asked Jesus to leave. And so Jesus did just that and he, he, came, he came back. And so in verse number 21, Jesus is coming back to where he had been before. And when he got there, there was a bunch of people standing around waiting on him. He, he came back to a hopeful atmosphere. They, he had only been gone for a day, but he had been gone long enough to a whole bunch of folks now have gathered around him. In this group is this man named Jairus who's, whose daughter is at the point of death. And in this group is this woman who has an issue of blood 12 years and can't get no better. But in this group, there's a bunch of hopeful people waiting and, and hoping to get something from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I believe the Bible's trying to give us a contrast between Gadara and these people because I, I believe Jesus don't go some places because they don't want Him there. I believe the Lord doesn't spend a lot of time in some places because... They don't want him there. He might pay a visit to rescue that one that does want him, but he's checking out pretty soon. And he's going to go where, where he's wanted. He's going to go where, he's, where people are having faith. He, he told many cities. He told, he, he told uh, Capernaum. He told uh, uh, Galilee, not Galilee. He told several Tyre and Sidon. He said, he said I would have done many works, but, but I couldn't because of your hardness, and because of your unbelief. He told the Jews, he said, How often would I have gathered you under my wing like a mother hen does her chicks, but you would not. So Jesus, Jesus goes where he's wanted. Now, and these people in Gadara, they didn't want him. And it's not my message this morning, but I don't want Jesus to not come here because you don't want him here. The people in Gadara, there's three things why they didn't, why they didn't want him. Number one, he costs too much money. I mean, a whole hog business went bankrupt, just like that. And he didn't want Jesus around because he just cost too much money. Well, Baptists don't like that, do they? He costs too much money. He don't just cost too much money, he proves too many motives. Look, when they saw this man who had been possessed, th what they did was they had chains and fetters put them out in the tombs. That was, that was their solution to it. Jesus heals the man, and in verse... Are y'all all right this morning? 
Jesus heals the man and he's sitting at Jesus' feet clothed in his right mind. And verse number 15, they were afraid of that. And they, depart, they asked Jesus to get out of their coast, verse number 17. When Jesus gets around, see, he'll prove your motives. He'll, he'll help somebody a lot worse than you and prove to the whole world how selfish and self-centered and hard-hearted and calloused and uncompassionate you really are. That's what he did with them. He went to town and got the worst sinner you could possibly find and helped that one. And they said, uh uh uh-uh. We're not all about that. They asked him to leave. Not one person showed gratitude for, for God helping this poor man. Not one person was excited. They were afraid of it. Here Jesus is, just help the worst, most most down and out sinner you could possibly ever find in the history of the world. And ain't nobody happy about it. Well, that fits the good independent Baptist movement, don't it? Us four and no more. Well, y'all aren't liking this. I'm talking about when Jesus shows up, he'll start proving people's motives. He'll show you what you really are. So a lot of people would just rather him not be around because we've got everybody fooled. We've got, we've got everybody thinking we're good people. We've got the whole South beguiled into thinking that all these churches are just of God and have the best attitude and everyone's got a great spirit and everybody loves everybody when couldn't nothing be further from the truth. Yeah, you want God to do something for your aunt and for your family, but if he starts helping that poor family across the street that embarrasses you, you... He's going to get, you're going to get real uncomfortable. How about a poem? Will that make y'all feel better? If I make it all rhyme. They said, Jesus be gone. Our ways are not as thine. Thou lovest men. We love the swine. Oh, get you hence with all of your omnipotence and take this fool of thine. Thou lovest men. We love the swine. His soul... What care we for his lost soul? What good to us is this that thou hast made him whole? Since we've lost our swine, we would like for you to go. And Christ sadly went, though he had wrought for them a sign of love and hope. They just wanted swine. Christ stands without the door and knocks, but if we love gold or swine more, the door stays locked. He forces no man's hold and he will depart and leave us to the meanness of a swine's heart. Well, Jesus left one atmosphere and went to another. How drastically different. One group on one side of the sea wants him to leave. The other is standing there waiting on him. Look, in verse number 21, he can't, even get, he can't even get away from the water. He can't even get into town. He was nigh into the sea. They're thronging him. So they're hoping. They're looking for something. They know it's him. Well, that sure would be good to see, wouldn't it? It was a hopeful atmosphere. But number, number two, look in verse 22. It was not just a hopeful atmosphere, it was a humble atmosphere. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her. She may be healed and she shall live. Here this, this man of great, of great reputation, this ruler of the synagogue, falling down at the feet of Jesus. If, if my memory serves me correct, Brother William, this is the only Jewish man to ever do that. This is the only Jewish man to ever fall down at the feet of Jesus. Here this man is, his name means something. He's Jairus. He's a ruler of the synagogue at, Uh, he had had climbed the religious ladder. His family meant something. His little girl that was sick, probably everybody knew who she was. I'm going to go out on a real big limb and say that I think they knew Jesus. This in Capernaum, Jesus lived in Capernaum. I believe they knew each other. I believe Jesus knew this little girl. He was probably at the synagogue the first time she came for Sabbath worship. Here this man is with well, all his, all his uh, uh, pharisaical dress. and he, I mean, he was a Pharisee. You can't be a ruler without being a Pharisee. 
And he comes in with all his Pharisee clothes on, all of the things he's reached in his status, and he comes and he falls down at the feet of Jesus because his little girl lieth at the point of death. And he says, I pray you come, lay thy hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. What humility. And then we have this other woman in verse number 25 that had the issue of blood. She comes up and she, on the ground, touches the hem of his garment, touches the border of it, Luke chapter number 8. Touches the border on the ground. What a humility. I mean, I know you know you need Jesus, but would you crawl for it? I mean, we live in a generation of people so proud they won't even come to an altar. I said, we live in a generation so proud they won't even come to an altar with carpet. And when I'm looking at them, this woman didn't care. She'd got, this man had gotten over his pride. This woman had gotten over her pride, was willing to get on the floor to get to Jesus. That's humble. It's a humble atmosphere. Humble atmosphere. Brother Stephen, I, I, at one point, when I, I mean, I'm still young, when I was a lot younger, I wanted a real talented church. Yeah, you never know, every now and then you go to one of those churches, they got 47 piano players, and they got, a, they got 30 people that can play, and everyone in there can sing, and ought to be on... Uh, some talent show and everyone in there can preach like Forked Lightning and just great at everything. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? You know what I'd rather have? I'd rather have a humble church. Check the talent at the door. Let's, let's get some humble people. I don't know if I'm missing it so bad that I'm just off today or if I'm right on it and the Holy Ghost is convicting you. I don't know. I can't tell. I want some humble people. You know why I want humble people, Miss Steffi? Because the Bible says in multiple places, He resisteth the proud. Stiff arms them. Says, get away from me. Back up. Get out of my space. But you know what the rest of that verse says? But He giveth grace to the humble. He giveth grace unto the humble. This man whose daughter was at the point of death was the recipient of great grace that day. This woman who had had an issue of blood 12 years was the recipient of great grace because they humbled themselves. Humbled themselves. It was an atmosphere of humility. But it was also an, a, a hurting atmosphere. Look, this woman has, in verse number 26... She has suffered many things of many physicians, had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. Look down at verse number 35. Verse 35. While he yet spake, Jesus, while he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead, why troublest thou the master? any further. Well, these were some hurting people. This woman has not got anything but bad news ever. She's going to the doctors over and over and over. She has spent all that she has. She has now broke. She can't afford nothing else. And she's still sick. And she's not just sick. She's worse. She's worse than she was when she started. She's hurting. This father has just got the worst news that a parent can ever get. It's too late. She's already gone. Leave God alone and just, go, just come back. I mean, these people are hurting. These people, their hearts are broke. This woman's probably got bitterness in her heart. She's trusted man after man after man after man and, and doctor after doctor after doctor. She has suffered at the hands of their malpractice. She has spent everything. Now she has no money and she's worse than she's ever been. Here this man is and his little girl's now gone. He's at his worst. He's worse than ever. You will not find a more discouraged person than someone who has tried everything and only gotten worse. You won't find someone more discouraged than someone who's not just in a bad way, but someone who's in a bad way and tried everything they could to get out, but they're still in a bad way. Now, you got some people that are in a bad way and they just cool with it. John chapter number 5, Jesus walks to, the, uh, to that pool 
And there's a man who's been laying there 38 years, and he said, Wilt thou be made whole? I got no man to put me in. It's, it's kinda, just kind of living with it now. Just kind of giving up, accepting the new norm. Sometimes that happens. It's called giving up. It's called giving up. But this woman and this dad, they're not giving up. I mean, they're trying. You understand what it costs this man to go put his faith in Jesus Christ? He's going to lose everything. He's, he's going to lose his spot in the synagogue. What he's worked years to get to, the, the, the job he's always he's going to lose it all. Because the Pharisees are trying to kill Jesus at this point, unless you, you forgot. You know, what they, you know what, Brother Stephen? He was in the meetings with them. He's a ruler. His, his, he's there for his brain. His decisions, are, he's in on the meetings. He's going to go against everything because he knows his little girl's dying with him and he's got to get Jesus. But now it's worse than ever. I wonder if any of you would be honest enough to say a lot of times before you ever go to Jesus, you try everything else in the world first. And what you bring to Jesus is worse than it was before. <laughs> I love what she says here in verse number 28. She said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. If I may but touch but his clothes. How many of you understand that? God's not in clothes. You know, there's, there's, there's entire world religions that are all about relics. You know, go, there, there, and there's statues in, in, down in Mexico that, are just, that have just been worn, not by the weather, but by people's, by people's lips kissing it. Number one, that is nasty. That's, that's just Gross. But we all understand God's not in relics. Oh, I think we do anyway. I think a lot of good independent Baptists are real hung up on some relics. Don't move that. Don't move that piece of furniture. Don't. Good grief. God ain't in relics. You know what's interesting? And with Jairus, what did he pray? He said, I pray thee, come, lay thy hands on my daughter, and she shall live. Is that what he said? He said, I want you to come touch my little girl. Lay your hand. She said, if I can just touch him. If I could just touch his clothes. So the, Jairus is praying, I want you to come touch my child. This woman's praying, if I could just touch him. Oh, those are opposites. They're opposites. Well, we're independent Baptists. If things are different, one's got to be wrong. I do like being a Baptist, by the way. I'm just picking. One says, I need God to touch my child. One says, I need to touch God. Which one's right? Which one's wrong? Both. Which one's right? Both. And neither. Both and neither, Brother Stephen. You see, there has already been Matthew chapter number 7, Luke chapter number 6 or, or, or 7. There's already been a Roman centurion come to Jesus and say, I've got a servant at home that's sick and dying, and he's like a son to me. I need you to heal him. And Jesus says, okay, I'll come to your house. He says, no, 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 no. I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. You just speak the word, and he'll be healed. And Jesus marveled, the Bible says, because he said, I've not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. This man has enough faith. There's no touch necessary. He just needs me to say it. So this man doesn't need a touch. This man needs God to touch his child. This woman says, I've got to get to God and touch him. 
What I'm trying to say is faith doesn't have to be perfect. Faith doesn't have to be perfect. It just needs to be in somebody that is. Faith doesn't have to be perfect. It just needs to be in someone that is perfect. What did she touch? She touched his garment. Luke chapter 8 and verse number 44 says she touched the border of his garment. What's the border of something? This pulpit has a border. You probably can't see it from here, but it has some trim all the way around it. It's the border. You know what that is? That's the outside edge. When she touched the hem of his garment, all she did was touch the outside edge of who he was. I mean, she's mere inches from his feet that could walk on water. She didn't touch those. She didn't touch the back that would bear the cross. She didn't touch the back that would receive the cat of nine tails by whose stripes we are healed. She didn't touch that. She didn't touch the shoulders that would bear the governments of the universe and would carry the cross. She didn't touch the head that would take the, the crown of thorns. She didn't touch the head that, had a, that contained memories of creation, eternity past and eternity. She didn't touch none of that. All she did was touch the, the border of him. Faith don't have to be perfect. You don't have to know everything about God to get a prayer answered. You don't have to know all there is. You don't have to have master the theology of Christology to be able to get saved. All she did was touch the hem. I mean, how many children get saved at church and all they know about God is that He is and His name is Jesus. They know that He died. They know that He resurrected and, and, they, and they believe that. But they, they, they don't know all the great doctrines of the Son of God. You don't have to have perfect. You don't have to have perfect. Faith doesn't have to be perfect, but it sure is pricey. By the time she's come to Jesus, she's spent all. She's spent everything she's had. Matthew, I believe, says she spent all her living. All her living. She has nothing left. How many times has that happened? We, come, we finally break down and come to Jesus after we've tried everything else. We've looked for hope down every bottle and everything appeals and every drink and every substance. We've shot it up our arms, shot it up our nose. Tried to find it in women, tried to find it in men. I wish y'all would help me a little bit. How many times have we come to Jesus at the absolute last? Now, I, I do want you to see this. I'm going I'm to I'm give her a pass. Verse number 27. I want you to look at it, and I want you to read the first four words with me. When she had heard of Jesus. Somebody said, you know what you need? You know what you need? She probably heard that a lot, to be honest with you. I'm sure, I'm sure a, good, a, a, a good friend sat her down and said, Honey, you know what you really need to do? You need to call this doctor down the street. I, I bet you he can help you. He helped my cousin, blah, 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 blah. I bet you probably need to go down there and see him. Okay, so she goes there and sees him. Well, guess what? It didn't work. So then another time, so, an, another person sits her down and says, You know what you probably need to do? You need to go call this, this doctor because I bet you, I bet you they got the answer because they helped so and so, and I bet you they can help you. And on and on and on the list goes. And I bet it got to the point where if somebody else tried to tell her what she needed, she's ready to slap them. I don't know about you, but I've been there. I don't want to hear no one else's advice. Can't, you can't help me. I don't want to hear no one else's idea. Don't recommend anybody else to me. But one day, somebody told her about Mark chapter 3 and verse number 10. Mark 3 and verse, you know what it says? It says that there was these people thronging Jesus, falling down at his feet, and as many as touched him were made whole. Someone said, no, 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 this isn't another doctor. This isn't the same. This is not like what you're thinking. Somebody told her about Jesus Christ. Somebody talked, told her about a physician. They didn't have any fees. Mmm. Good thing because she don't have anything to pay him. Now all she's got is a diseased body. She can't pay God even if God came with a price tag. She came to Jesus because somebody told her. 
Ain't you glad somebody told you about the Lord? Ain't you glad somebody told you about God? And told you about the Lord? You say, well, I was born into a Christian home. Well, thank God somebody told your parents about God. Well, my parents were born into a Christian home. Then thank God somebody told your grandparents about God. Hey, look, I was born, I, my daddy's been a preacher since I was little. I think my big sister, I think my big sister was alive when daddy got saved. Is that right, Katie? I think Ashley was already alive when daddy got saved. But mom and daddy's already saved by the time me and Katie came along. Thank God for that. Brother Mark, Brother Mark Strauss says when he was saving him, he was saving you. How about that? How about that? Somebody told her. I know you're probably sick of hearing it. Someone's giving you advice over and over and over again. Someone's giving you marital advice. Someone's giving you financial advice. Someone's giving you parent, parental advice. They've given you addiction advice. You've been told this and this and this and this and this and this and this until you're flat out sick of hearing it. You've been told how to forgive. You've been told how to get rid of bitterness. And someone's told you and tried to help you and tell you and tell you and tell you. And I know you're sick of hearing it. But just let me say one more time. Jesus can help you. Jesus can help you. He doesn't charge. He doesn't, you don't have to bring a copay. You don't have to have a special insurance card. You don't have to have a membership in any kind of club or any kind of church. You just got to get to Jesus. He can help you. He can help you. This is a hurting atmosphere. I believe there's a lot of Sundays, this place is a hurting atmosphere. People have tried to fix it and it's gotten worse. She believed, if I could just touch his garment, I shall be whole. Oh, what faith. What faith. Well, I've got an entire message laying on this pulpit. That was the introduction. You know what Mark chapter 5 is all about, Brother Ray? It's about people that are worse than ever. It's about people at their rock bottom. It's about men who the only thing that could be worse is if they just died. And that might would be relief. That might would just make things better if they just passed. Y'all all right? Yeah. That old man in the tombs, he's obsessed with death. He lives in a graveyard. He wants to die. It's about people at rock bottom. A lot of times God can't even help you until you get to rock bottom. Because at this point, he's just another option. He's just another option. I'm real tired of this little phrase that's going through our, our, our churches. Try Jesus. No, you try Pepsi. Or Coke. You try a new restaurant. Don't try Jesus. You trust him. There's three people, real fast, there's three people in Mark 5 that are, that are at rock bottom ready to trust him. There's a maniac of Gadara. There's a demon-possessed man with a legion of demons. There's a man that's just too lost. He's too lost. He's too far gone. Can't help that. Chains and fetters can't bind him. He's too lost. Society says he's too far gone. I got news for you. You can't get saved until you're too lost. So you're too lost. And there's a woman with too little. She spent everything she had. Wasn't enough. You know what? You, 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 could, you could spend all the money in the world and still be sick. Steve Jobs, one of the richest men in the world. Money couldn't fix him, could it? Robin Williams, a highly acclaimed actor with probably more money than you and I can ever dream of, 
took his own life. Didn't have enough money. You can't buy it. You can't buy it. You can't buy it. You can't buy what Jesus can give. It's just too little. But then there was a dad who was too late. Verse number 35, they come and they said, She's gone. Why troublest thou the master any further? You're too late. You've come too late. You waited till she was at the point of death. Now it's too late. Well, we do, we're guilty of that. You see, because church kids need God too. A lot of times parents don't start praying until it's too late. It's the truth. A lot of, time, a lot, a lot of times Christian parents don't get worried until they start finding stuff in the house. You waited too long. Y'all all right? Brother Robert, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to preach. This man, by the time he came to Jesus, she was at the point of death. Religion had already failed, as it always does. Maybe if I come down here, y'all help me a little bit more. What do you say? I got 14 minutes. Brother Derek's got an appointment today. He said, I got to be done at. Did you say 12 15? Oh, then you got 14 minutes. <laughs> and I got my favorite spot now, so you better call them RSVP. Save me a seat. What was I saying, Miss Jill? Parents waiting too late. That's what I was saying. The point of death. I said a minute ago, Jesus, don't, God don't normally help us till we, get to our, till, till we get to rock bottom because until we get to that point, He's just another option. We reach a point where He becomes the only option at the point of death. And then someone from His house came and they said, Oh, it's too late. It's too late. She's already gone. I'm tired of hearing that too. Because Jesus said, don't be afraid, only believe. He said, oh, it's never too late with me. <laughs> he said, be not afraid, only believe. He came to the house. They're all making a great tumult. They're weeping and crying, as well they should be. This little girl's just passed. Twelve-year-old child. That ain't supposed to happen. And they're all weeping. And Jesus said, oh, hold on. He says, take me to a room. You know what? He said, she's not dead. She sleepeth. You know what? You know what the Bible says? That they laughed at him. They laughed at him. The Bible says they laughed him to scorn. The Bible's got some harsh words in it, but they're all the right words. They laughed at him. It's too late. It's too late. You can't do nothing for her. Jesus went in her room, took Peter, James, and John and her parents took her by the hand and said, Talanakuma, which is daughter, arise. And she got up. It wasn't too late. It wasn't too late. Not, it was too late with man. It was too late with the greatest doctor you could find. But it wasn't too late with Jesus. The man wasn't too lost. The woman didn't have too little. And this little girl, this dad, wasn't too late. Because with Jesus, it's never too lost. It's never too little. And it's never too late. All these people are at their worst. But when man is at his worst, Jesus is at his best. When man is at their worst, Jesus is at his best. Oh, what a good God. Miss Leslie, can you come? Oh, what a good God. When man is at his worst, God is at his best. When it's worse than it's ever been. When you've tried everything you know to try, nothing's worked. Trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. I'm telling you, there's no one more discouraged than someone who's tried over and over and over again, and it just ain't getting better. I mean, it, it's like banging your head against a brick wall. That's rough, ain't it? That's rough. But when man
man's at his worst. God is at his best. 